This is Chapter 3, Control Volume Analysis, Part 10. This is the last major technical topic in Chapter 3. In this video, I'll be talking about the steady flow energy equation. What we will be doing is extending the Bernoulli equation to include the analysis of pumps, turbines, and frictional losses, also called head losses. We'll be doing a little bit of housekeeping, uh, applying something called the kinetic energy correction factor, and then learning about hydraulic power and turbine and pump efficiency. Once we've covered the material for this uh, video, I'll do a numerical analysis for a hydropower station using the energy equation, and then I'll end this video by talking about different types of water turbines that are commonly used for electrical power generation, things like Pelton, Francis, and Kaplan turbines. Okay, so what we're going to do now is derive the steady flow energy equation, which is really an extension of the Bernoulli equation. And I'm going to take a slightly different approach than the textbook. I'm going to take a non-thermodynamic approach for the derivation of the steady flow energy equation. The main reason is because biomedical engineering students do not get MEC 309 thermodynamics 1. So recall that for Bernoulli's equation, there were no energy losses. And I've drawn over here on the right hand side, I've drawn a streamline going from point 1 to point 2. And Bernoulli's equation applied for so-called inviscid flow. Inviscid flow, again, is a flow that has no viscosity, so it's frictionless. And so if it's a frictionless flow, the total energy in the flowing fluid at point 1 equals the total energy of the fluid at point 2. Remember, we have up here, we have the, the pressure energy, or what's called flow work, the kinetic energy, and the potential energy the sum of those three are equal at point one and point two. In this form of the Bernoulli equation, which is actually a form that I like to use a lot, each term represents energy per unit weight of the flowing fluid. I mentioned to you that this, in this form, each term is referred to as head. So we have pressure head, velocity head, and elevation head. So next, we can modify this equation to account for energy additions and extraction. And I've drawn here again over on the right-hand side here. I'll draw your attention to the streamline. And I've added a dot that represents a pump and a dot that represents a turbine. And of course, a pump is a location where energy is added to the flow uh, to drive the flow forward. And a turbine is a device that extracts energy uh, usually for electrical generation purposes. And then, of course, there's energy extraction just naturally in a pipe because of the viscous shear stress at the wall and, and turbulence. So there's energy losses because of pipe friction and turbulence. Now, I've put losses here. Of course, energy is not lost. But what happens is the energy in the flow gets converted to heat the uh, fluid gets in the pipe gets warmed a little bit. But for the purpose of Bernoulli's equation, it's lost because we're only keeping track of, remember, we're only keeping track of pressure energy, kinetic energy, and elevation head. We're not keeping track of thermal energy. So for a steady state system, we can add these additional energy addition and energy removal terms. And what I've written down here is just some very simple energy accounting. So the total energy at 1 minus the energy that's extracted by the turbine plus the energy that's added by the pump minus energy losses by friction equals the energy at 2. As I say, this is just simple accounting. It's like your bank account. You know, your balance at the beginning of the month minus what you take out plus what you add uh, equals the balance at the end of the month. It's as simple as that. It's just common sense. So here's the steady energy equation. What I've done is written Bernoulli's equation with these extra terms. So we have the fluid energy at 1, 
minus the energy extracted by the turbine plus the energy added by the pump minus the energy that's converted to heat by fluid friction equals the energy at 2. Now keep in mind that this equation in the form that I've written is dimensionally homogeneous, so every term in this equation has the dimensions of length or height, and the units for every term here is meters. H turbine is the turbine head, and it's the energy extracted from 1 to 2 by the turbine per unit of weight of fluid flowing. H pump similarly is the energy added from 1 to 2 by the pump per unit weight of fluid, and H friction is the energy loss uh, due to fluid friction from 1 to 2 per unit weight of fluid. We refer to these as turbine head, pump head, and head loss when we write the uh, energy equation in this form where every term has the units of meters. Now before we can use the general energy equation, there's one little bit of housekeeping. It has to do with uh, the, the fact that the kinetic energy isn't quite accounted for correctly in that equation uh, for non-uniform flows. So we're going to talk about the kinetic energy correction factor, and it has to do with the fact that real flows are not one-dimensional. And I've drawn over here, of course, a, a sort of a turbulent velocity profile. Uh, the fluid sticks at the wall, we have the no-slip condition, and so it's not a truly uh, uniform flow, uh, but the maximum flow in the center of the pipe is greater than the, the average velocity. And for a non-uniform flow, you can show that one-half v-bar squared is not a perfect measure of the total kinetic energy per unit mass in the flow. And you'll see this is particularly true for uh, laminar flows. The reason it's not a perfect measure is because of the non-linearity. Local fluid kinetic energy varies with the local velocity u of y squared. And so we can define a correction factor, alpha, such that the actual kinetic energy in the non-uniform flow equals the kinetic energy in uh, the uniform flow. We often make the assumption of a uniform flow at velocity v bar, and we apply this uh, correction factor alpha so that they're exactly equal. Now let, let's just look at these integrals for a moment. One half u squared is the local kinetic energy per unit mass, and then the integral over the area of the pipe here of rho u dA is, it, when you do that, that's going to give you m dot. So what you have here is kinetic energy per unit mass times mass per unit time. So this is the amount of kinetic energy flowing in the pipe per unit time. And that, when you, if you knew the velocity distribution, if you knew u of y here, you could evaluate that. Now, in our general energy equation, our steady energy equation, we're going to make the assumption of a uniform flow, this uniform one-dimensional flow, and we're going to use v-bar. And so if we use v-bar, so here's our, again, our, our kinetic energy per unit mass, one-half uh, v-bar squared, and there's our, our, our mass flow rate term. And then we define this term alpha that sets the kinetic energy flow in the real flow equal to the kinetic energy flow in this approximate flow where we assume a uniform velocity profile. So what I've done on the next page is just rewritten that equation. It's the same equation as on the previous slide. And just a little simplification here, you can see rho is on both sides, so we can cancel out rho. You can see the half is on both sides, we can cancel out half. So you can see this is going to become u cubed dA. And on this side, we're going to have alpha v bar cubed A. Makes sense? And then we can solve for alpha. Uh, and I brought the v bar cubed inside. So we get this nice little simple integral here. And this correction factor has been evaluated for uh, various types of flows. Now, for laminar flow, we have an analytical solution. We know this, it's a parabola. For turbulent flows, uh, we can make measurements of the velocity profile. We can make measurements of, of u of y here.
and actually evaluate this correction factor. And here's sort of a summary of the results. There's a lot of details in your textbook on this. But of course, if you had a true uniform flow, which actually can't exist because of, well, it can't exist in a pipe because of the no slip condition of the wall, uh, then alpha is 1, of course, because the kinetic energy in the uniform flow would equal the kinetic energy in the actual flow. If you have a laminar flow in a round pipe, you end up with this parabolic profile. We talked about it in previous video, and we're going to show this in I think chapter four. And if you actually perform that integration, you get that alpha equals two for a round pipe. That means that the, a laminar flow has two times more kinetic energy uh, than a uniform flow with the same average velocity. So if we didn't apply this alpha correction, we would make a significant error. And the reason is because of the nonlinearity. The maximum velocity here is significantly different. In fact, it's it's two times the average velocity. And so when you perform that integration, you get a lot more kinetic energy because of the nonlinearity, because kinetic energy varies as the local velocity squared. But for turbulent flows, we talked about this in a previous video, that because of the turbulent transport in the pipe, you get a much more uniform uh, velocity profile across the center of the pipe. The difference between the average and the maximum, so v bar here, and, and the maximum velocity is not that great in a turbulent flow. And so the assumption of a uniform flow and alpha equals 1 is a much better approximation. And of course, they've done measurements of the velocity profiles in turbulent flows, and you can show that alpha varies approximately from about 4% to 11% extra kinetic energy than for the uniform flow assumption. So uniform flow is not a bad assumption for turbulent conditions. So here's the, the steady flow energy equation. Again, this time I've rewritten it with these extra terms, alpha and alpha in here, to correct for the fact that we're assuming uh, uniform flow in this equation. Often you'll notice in the problem sets that alpha is not given. So we'll make the approximation that alpha equals 1. And the reason that's not such a bad approximation is that most real-world flows are turbulent. And turbulent flows, the maximum and average velocities are not that different. So the nonlinearity effect isn't as great as it is for laminar flows. So often you'll just ignore that uh, kinetic energy correction factor. But I mention it, and the book mentions it, because it can be very important for laminar flows. I also want to emphasize that when you're using the steady flow energy equation, when you're using this equation, it's got a red box around it because it's kind of a final result. Keep in mind that it's based on Bernoulli's equation. So it only applies for steady flow or flows that are changing relatively slowly. So there's not a, not a lot of inertial effects. It also technically only applies for incompressible flows. So flows where density is a constant. And we showed that you can make that assumption for gases for uh, Mach numbers less than 0.3. And in that case, you'd apply the energy equation at the average fluid density. Sometimes you might have a little heat addition in the flow as well, and that could cause the gas to warm up. Again, you'd, you'd apply, technically, Bernoulli's equation doesn't apply, but provided the density change is not large, you could use Bernoulli's equation or this steady flow energy equation and apply the equation at the average uh, dense flow density. It also applies, of course, for a flow along a streamline. You see, we're always going to do problems where I define a streamline in the pipe and apply the energy equation from one point on the streamline to another point on the streamline. Before we can do a problem, uh, the sample problem, we need to talk about hydraulic power, P. Now, I'll talk about hydraulic power from the perspective of a pump to start off. A pump adds energy to the flow. Of course, the purpose of the pump is to, is to drive the fluid along the pipe, really to overcome the, the fluid friction in the pipe. And I've shown over here a picture of, on the right-hand side, a picture of a centrifugal pump. And you can see a cutaway there. It shows the impeller which spins up by a motor, and of course 
in a centrifugal pump, fluid is drawn into the center and uh, gets centrifuged out and flows out the nozzle at the top. We saw in a previous video, I showed a submersible pump and the pump specifications are given in terms of head. That's that H pump term. And H pump, I'll remind you, is the energy added per unit weight of fluid passing through the pump. So what's the power of the input into the pump? How many watts uh, do we uh, add? Does the pump add to the fluid? Well, the, the way to figure this out, and I've written it down here, I've actually shown the result here. The pumping power in watts is gamma of the fluid, volume flow rate Q, times the head of the pump. And I've written in words here so you can make sense of this equation. Of course, this is the energy added to the fluid per unit time, so joules per second or watts. So this is the, the power, the shaft power going into the pump. And you can see if we, this is the weight of fluid pumped per unit time. So gamma is the number of newtons per cubic meter of the fluid, so weight per unit volume, and then Q is volume per unit time. So you can see here when you cross these terms out that gamma Q is the weight of fluid passing through the pump per unit time. And then we already defined this H pump as the energy added per unit weight, so joules per newton. And so you can see this newton cancels with that newton. And so you can see you get joules per second. So I think it's not a strict derivation of this, but just the multiplication of the terms, you can see how, how this equation works. So the pumping power is the head of the pump times gamma Q. So I've rewritten the equation up here. The hydraulic power input to the fluid by the pump is gamma Q times the, this head of the pump. However, the transmission of power from the shaft to the fluid has some losses. There's not perfect transmission of shaft power into uh, uh, power that's added to the fluid. And so the pump has a certain efficiency. Pumps don't operate at 100% efficiency. They operate at a number eight. A pump would be, would be typically substantially less than one. And it's the ratio of P pump over P input. So P pump is the energy that's imparted to the fluid, and P input is the required shaft power input from the motor. Of course, the input power is greater than the energy that actually ends up getting transferred to the fluid. And recall, I don't think we're going to use this much, but the shaft power of a pump would be the shaft torque times the angular velocity in radians per second. You can do exactly the same analysis for turbines. Of course, turbines are extracting energy, not adding energy to the flow. So the hydraulic power that's extracted from a fluid by a turbine is given by this expression here. So the theoretical power of a turbine is gamma Q times the head of the turbine. Again, this extraction process is not perfect. There's some losses between uh, from the fluid to the shaft. Turbines operate at substantially below 100% efficiency, although a very good one would operate quite high up into the 90s percent range. So we can define overall turbine efficiency, eta turbine, as the output power over the theoretical hydraulic power that's extracted from the fluid. And of course, uh, the output power would be less than the, the theoretical power that's extracted from the fluid. There's some losses there. Typically what's happening, again, is that friction and turbulence is converting uh, some of the energy into heat. And in this expression, P output is the useful shaft power output to the generator, which is less than P turbine. Uh, the hydraulic power that's extracted from the fluid.
So now we can do an example. I'm going to do an example for a turbine. I could have done an example for a pump. It just works in uh, the opposite direction. Instead of having energy extraction, you have energy addition. So I don't think there was a need to do one of each. I've picked a turbine. And the problem statement says that water is supplied to a hydraulic turbine at a flow rate of 150 cubic feet per second through a pipe with an inside diameter of 3 feet. The supply pressure at section 1 is 60 psi gauge, so section 1 over here. So of course the flow is going in this direction. The discharge pipe has an inside diameter of 4 feet. Here's a section 2. And the static pressure 10 feet below the turbine inlet We've got the, the change in elevation here. Is that pressure at section two is 10 inches of mercury vacuum pressure. We'll talk about how to deal with that. The frictional head loss in the pipes from one to two is 17.7 feet. And the turbine has an overall efficiency of 85%. So using these facts, we want to calculate the power output that is supplied to the electric generator. So we want to calculate P output. So we start with the steady state energy equation. This is a steady state problem. And I've written it down in its full general form. Of course, there's no pump. So H there's no energy added by a pump. We only have a turbine, so that term disappears. The problem statement, which I took from a, a, another textbook, doesn't mention kinetic energy correction factor. The, at these kind of flow rates, the Reynolds number is going to be very high. We have turbulent flow, so we're going to approximate the kinetic energy correction factor as one, and that's a standard approach. Unless it mentions it, uh, assume it's one. And after the the head of the turbine, and then I'll multiply it by the, the gamma q to get the power of the turbine later on. So what I've done is I've solved this equation for the head of the turbine. And let's just have a quick look at this, make sure this is right. The head of the turbine is going to come over the other side of the equation, and so you're going to get, that's correct, that's the pressure energy extracted from 1 to 2. Then you've got v1 squared minus v2 squared upon 2g, that's the velocity head that's extracted, the amount of kinetic energy that's extracted from the fluid from 1 to 2. And then there's the elevation change. That's the potential energy that's been extracted from 1 to 2. And then, of course, we have some losses due to friction. And of course, what's going to happen when we move H turbine over H friction will have a negative sign. It's going to reduce the power, the power output from the turbine. So it makes sense that there's a negative sign here. So here, again, we're not working on a blackboard, so you, when I flip slides, you, you can't see the previous equation, so I've just rewritten this equation here. I'm just copying it over. So now we can start evaluating some terms. P1, you're told, is 60 PSI, that's pounds per square inch gauge. Uh, you need to convert that to pounds per square foot to have a consistent set of units. And there's 12 inches per foot, so I've multiplied that by 144 square inches per foot squared to get the pressure at point 0.1. The pressure at point 0.2, you're told, is 10 inches of mercury vacuum. Now, is that a gauge pressure? Think about that for a moment. You can't go below zero absolute, so as soon as you get an uh, a vacuum pressure that has to be a gauge pressure. Your, your 10 inches of mercury below atmospheric pressure is what that's saying. So that's why I've put a negative sign here. The pressure at 2 is, remember pressure is gamma mercury H mercury, so then I change that into use the specific gravity of mercury which is 13.6 times the gamma of water times this height of mercury, which is 10 inches. And the negative sign here is because it's a vacuum pressure. It's 
10 inches of mercury below atmospheric pressure. You can work in absolute units or, or gauge pressure, but you need both of them. You need both pressures to be in the same set of units. That wouldn't matter if these were both absolute. You could add, what's it, 14 point seven pounds pounds per square inch to each one of these numbers and it wouldn't make a difference. But in this case, since we have P1 engage, we certainly want to have P2 engage as well. So here it is evaluated. Specific gravity of mercury, 13.6. The specific weight of water, 62.4 pounds per cubic feet. And then the height of mercury, which you have to have in feet, 10 over 12 feet, and you can see, oops, there's a typographical error there. Okay, we fixed it. It's You can check the units here. Feet cancels with feet, and you should get square feet. So there's the uh, pressure minus 707.2 pounds per square feet, which is a gauge pressure, of course. You can't go below absolute zero. So carrying on here, I've rewritten the, our, our uh, equation again that we're trying to evaluate. Now, so we've got P1, we've got P2, now I'm going after the velocities. We're told that the flow rate is 150 cubic feet per second. And we divide, to get V1, divide that by A1. The diameter here is 3 feet of the pipe. So pi d squared upon 4. And you can see that the units work here. We cancel square feet, we're going to have it feet per second. So the answer is 21.22 feet per second at 1. And similarly, we can do the same thing at 2. The diameter at 2, the pipe diameter is 4 feet. So 150 cubic feet per second divided by pi d squared upon 4 gives a lower velocity of 11.994. Just as a minor point, uh, when you're doing problems, I like to carry four digits in intermediate calculations and then round the final result to three digits. It's just a good practice. Three digits is about as many digits as you'd want to carry in, a, in most engineering calculations. But you carry four in intermediate calculations so that you don't get accumulated round off there. So we've got, now we've got this velocity and that velocity and the elevation change here. Z1 minus Z2 is 10 feet. The friction losses in the pipe are 17.7 feet. And if you're having trouble with how friction losses can be a height, think of this as foot pounds, so energy per unit weight, right? So energy per unit weight just ends up giving units of feet. And that's given in the problem statement. So now we have everything. It's just a matter of making the substitution. So here I've made the substitution for P1, P2 pounds per square foot over gamma of water here, which is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. So you can see the pounds go with the pounds and the square feet. And you just end up with 1 over feet. So this whole term here is going to have units of feet, which is what we expect, right? And then for V1, we have 21.22 feet per second, V2, 11.94, and then 2G. G in the British system is 32.2 feet per second squared. And again, you can see uh, this is velocity squared, so feet squared per second squared. You can see that the units work out to feet. That goes with that. And then we have the elevation change, 10 feet, and uh, the head loss, uh, the frictional head loss, 17.7 feet. So I evaluated the terms. You can see the major term here, the biggest term, is the conversion of pressure energy or flow work into shaft power. And the kinetic energy, there's been some kinetic energy extracted from the flow, but only a small amount. And so we have a total turbine head of 146.7 feet. And so the power extracted from the water, the theoretical maximum is gamma Q times the head of the turbine. The gamma of the water is 62.4. The flow rate, uh, 150 
cubic feet per second, and then there's our head of the turbine in feet taken from here. Check the units out. Cubic feet cancels with cubic feet, and you end up with foot pounds per second. Exactly what you want. That's a unit of power in the British system, right? So we end up with 1.37 times 10 to the 6 foot pounds per second. That's the theoretical amount that could be extracted, but some of that, you know, some of that energy gets lost. You know, the turbine is not completely efficient in converting that energy into shaft power. There is some losses. Okay, so I've just rewritten this uh, theoretical maximum value, 1.375 times 10 to the 6 uh, foot-pounds per second. And I was just talking about how this is really a maximum. Turbines are not 100% efficient. There's some energy losses uh, in the uh, turbine. So the output is actually slightly smaller than this theoretical maximum. And we're told that the turbine efficiency is 85%. We're after the power output, and so the power output is 85% of this theoretical maximum. And I've used the fact that 550 foot-pounds per second is one horsepower. Didn't ask for it, but it, it's a more meaningful number to express the result as 2,120 horsepower, which is the answer to the problem. I thought I'd end, since I did an example on turbines, I thought I'd end by just talking a little bit about water turbines and, that are used for electrical power generation. The three main ones are Pelton Wheel, Francis Turbine, and Kaplan Turbine, and I'm going to talk about those briefly. So the first type is a Pelton Wheel Turbine here, and here's the, the, the rotor on a, a Pelton Turbine, and it uses a a high velocity jet of water that impinges upon these buckets on the outside of the, the uh, rotor. And a Pelton turbine is called an impulse turbine because it's converting the kinetic energy of the water, it's extracting the kinetic energy of the water to uh, obtain a torque force on the shaft. It's used when you have a high amount of head, when there's, when there's a great elevation change between the reservoir and the turbine. And as I pointed out, high velocity jets of water impinge upon these buckets. And we, we, you should have some idea of how this works, that the flow gets uh, sort of turned around 180 degrees when it hits these buckets. And that creates a, a force on the, the bucket because we calculated these forces on veins uh, using linear momentum theory earlier in chapter three. And here you can see in this picture down below on the left-hand side, you can see how these buckets, the water jet come in and these buckets are attached to a shaft. One of the most common types of turbines used is called a Francis turbine and it's a reaction turbine. I'll talk about why it's called a reaction turbine in a minute. And it's used where you have uh, sort of medium head installations where you have not such a great uh, elevation change between the reservoir and uh, the turbine. Unlike a Pelton wheel, it mainly extracts uh, pressure energy or flow work from the, from the flow, and that's why it's called a reaction turbine. The flow actually flows in from the outside here across these veins, and these veins act like airfoils, and the pressure difference across the, uh, the airfoil, the vein, uh, generates the torque, and that's why it's called a reaction turbine. And one of the applications is Sir Adam Beck Hydroelectric Power Station at Niagara Falls has a number of these Francis turbines that generate electric power. So they're used right here in Ontario at Niagara Falls. The last type of turbine I'm going to talk about is the Kaplan turbine shown here. It's used when you have a relatively low amount of head, when there's not a lot of height of water available to to generate large pressure forces. You'll see here that you can almost see it here that these blades, typically uh, the blades of a Kaplan turbine are adjustable. You can adjust the pitch so that the water attacks the blade at just the right angle to get the maximum efficiency. So that's 
three different common types of turbines that are used to generate electric power. We've talked about the general energy equation and then we've done an example on uh, how to calculate the power output from a turbine. And that completes chapter three.